ex-CIA here. Ask me anything. My area of operations was primarily Central Asia. I was involved in quite a specific scheme in Afghanistan, involving a strategic enemy's border region, I won't name who, but should be simple enough to guess. I'm probably not going to talk very much about that specifically, but it's a classic scheme, used many times before. Corruption, covering up for transfer of arms and money to certain groups. I have a decent amount of general internal knowledge though, and a few internal rumors heard through other agents. Okay, so here is what I know about UFOs. My distinct impression is that our government and the Air Force actually have no fucking idea what they are. Some portion of UFOs are actually just us testing our experimental aircraft, i.e. Area 51, but I'd say upwards of half are truly unexplained. I met the guy we had, who was like our resident Fox Mulder. He basically told me that it's embarrassing how little we know. He has fragments of information, very little hard evidence. He said he's almost certain they aren't from a foreign government. He thinks they're either actually extraterrestrial and we just truly cannot see them through sensors, or that they are some kind of natural phenomenon. Most of the higher-ups just frankly do not care about them. Except in so far as we can be sure they aren't Chinese. That's why we have one guy on it, and not a team. No interest. No idea if the Air Force might know more though, but my guess is no. CIA founded all the military coups in South America? Not all, but many. This isn't even really classified info though, like, we'll deny it. But it's like when Putin says he didn't try to interfere with 2016. Okay, since no one is asking anything, I would like to explain roughly how the intake process at the CIA works, because it's pretty extreme, and I've never really heard it discussed at length anywhere. So basically, everything will seem like a normal job interview during the first stage, with only a few hints at what will come. Then, in the second stage, they will put you through a thorough psych evaluation and ask general questions about your history and reasons for wanting to join. Simultaneously, they will talk to literally every person you have ever spoken to more than a couple times, acquaintances even. They will take any and every piece of information they get about you and compile it into a dossier which you will never, ever have access to. The third stage is the shortest and most intense. If you get to the third stage, you have basically passed every background check and have been selected to serve. The purpose of the third stage though, which lasts anywhere from 1 to 16 hours, is to try and psychologically break you. Basically, they bring you into a room, hook you to a lie detector test, and you sit across from a veteran agent who is pretending to be just the lie detector technician. Then, they bombard you with questions about every single bad thing you have ever done that they found out. The absolute most humiliating shit. Stuff you never even told anyone about. They will have found out about it and confront you about it angrily. They will also, and this is crucial to the process, also make up tons of just absolutely false stuff about you and also accuse you of those crimes and yell at you for being a traitor pervert, whatever. The only way to fail this test is to lie. The lie detector has absolutely nothing to do with determining if you told the truth. The veteran agent can tell much better than the machine, and your heart rate is jumping all over the fucking place during this too. It's actually a horrifying and traumatizing experience. Is Stargate legit? Does the US military still pursue parapsychological technology research? Yes, it was also more successful than is generally known. I believe research is still ongoing, even though they claim that officially it ended in the 90s. Is there some truth about that case that involved the US military finding a cave filled with some of Bigfoot Harmonic community and they killed every single one of them? I don't know anything about this, sorry. Also, is the USA struggling in some kind of Cold War 2.0? with Russia and China. Just China. 
Russia isn't actually a threat. Like, they're a threat to Ukraine, but not to the US. China is also kind of not really a threat either, but they could grow into one. Maybe there is a fourth party that is unknown to the public. If that's the case, could you elaborate? Thanks for the info. The fourth party is honestly Turkey. Much more threatening than Russia, and increasingly hostile. In order of threats to the US interests, I would put it like this. 1. China 2. Turkey 3. Russia Well, in order to keep the peace between the US and the Afghan government, we basically allowed them to do a lot of stuff we probably shouldn't have. Lots of corruption, abuse, sexual and otherwise, etc. Some of which I witnessed firsthand. I guess to some degree, we just accepted that the entire situation was a clusterfuck, and that we just needed to get through it. Zero. I don't think China has the operational capacity to invade Taiwan before maybe 2025 at the soonest, and if they tried before then, it would probably be a disaster for them. They simply don't have enough experience with the type of logistics necessary to pull it off yet. The biggest tell that they actually aren't planning to do it right now is that they keep talking about it. It's all posturing as a show for the Chinese public. Then, if and when China tries to invade Taiwan, our main strategy, and the Chinese know this, is going to be to put up the full air-sea battle doctrine, which basically amounts to us destroying all offensive military capacity, then destroying all Chinese domestic industrial capacity, and then we will go home. We do not plan to ever even attempt to invade and conquer China. Just beat them into the ground and make sure that they can't get back up for another 40 years. We're only going to do that if we have to. Again, most of us think China will simply collapse in the next 30 to 40 years, unless they do a really large amount of domestic changes. More so than Iran? Iran is actually not only a threat, but it's a strong contender to be a really great ally in the region. Culturally, and even from a strategic perspective, a lot of our goals are aligned. Depends on if work can be done to adequately repair the trust that was built between us during the Obama era. The Iranians still don't trust us, but have the potential to be a much greater ally to the US than even Israel, and certainly much more than the Saudis. The Iranian interests in nukes are almost entirely defensive. They don't want us to invade them, and they think nukes are about the only way to ensure that that will not happen. Agents are aware that they are pawns. This is literally our job. We know it before we get sent anywhere to do anything. But this Rothschild Illuminati bullshit is just wrong. The military industrial complex is real, but the methods of influence actual companies use are not as direct as imagined by conspiracy theorists. Agents are pawns for the long term strategic plans of the US. Arguably, we're pawns for the blob, which is much less inspiring, but also probably a bit more true if we're honest with ourselves. Part of the process of selecting people to serve at the CIA is to select people that truly, honestly believe in the common concept and promise of America. People who are in fact patriotic, but not solely patriotic. We also have to have a morality that is conditionally flexible and lawful. We also need to deeply want to serve. The concept of service towards something greater than yourself is extremely important, and I would say that all of us believe in it. No one at the CIA is a cynic or a nihilist. The process is designed to root these people out because they are dangerous and could flip against the US to other interests. We are all patriots, at least in our conception, but our loyalties are not to people we know, but to the concept of American governance and interests. We are almost exclusively ends focused, though in recent decades, there has been more thought given to the means since we cannot assume complete secrecy of our actions. What's the game plan for when America loses that conflict? So Taiwan is similar to Vietnam. The communists won in Vietnam, but the end result was a big fat nothing other than locally. If China wins in Taiwan, 
we will simply fortify the other points of constraint around them. Japan, South Korea, etc. Their war would be just beginning. And to be clear, I'm not saying it's not possible for the Chinese to overcome the US and actually become the leading world power. Just that we have made it very difficult for them and that I think we have a much better chance of winning than them. The president at the time splinters your agency into a million fucking pieces. Who would do this other than Trump? Hawley? Cruz? They tried to work at the CIA and were rejected. Even if someone did gut the agency, these plans and contingencies won't just disappear. SCP Foundation is the Saudi religious police because fighting witchcraft is one of their roles and they have made hundreds of arrests to that end. The Saudi royals are probably far more into witchcraft and shit like that than any other entrenched political class in the world. Probably the dumbest elites of any country too. MBS is dangerous because he is both clever and dumb. Like he's good at tactics, but absolutely one of the worst alive at constructing a realistic vision of the types of goals he should be working towards. The man is liable to do anything. He's like a Machiavellian that is more concerned with people seeing how clever he is than actually accomplishing anything. The entrenched death to America sentiment that is going to be a big hurdle. This is all Iranian government propaganda. The people of Iran don't give a shit about America or American power. They, if anything, hate the current Iranian government more than America due to decades of mismanagement. Iranians are extremely cosmopolitan and would gladly turn the state secular if given a chance. Was 9-11 an inside job? No. If we couldn't keep Iran-Contra under wraps, what makes you think we could have kept that a secret? The best movie about the CIA is Serania. It got a lot of stuff right. Tech levels are less important to CIA work than NSA. What do you believe the idea of America is? What is American governance in contrast to the rest of the world? So to paraphrase the Churchill quote about democracy, America is the worst of the global superpowers, except for all the others that have existed. I'm aware that America has flaws, has made mistakes, has done things that even I consider bad. In the end though, we have been the fairest and least oppressive global hegemon the world has ever seen. No other world power has ever left the seas completely open and mostly safe for everyone from every other country. If the Chinese were to succeed us, they would almost certainly not do the same. The fact of the matter is that the US serves an important role and that if we and our forces disappeared from the global stage, the world would be returned to 18th and 19th century chaos. Except this time, a lot of countries have nukes, and not all of them are going to be deterred by mutually assured destruction. This is simply not true. In fact, we still have a large amount of legitimacy. China is sort of less popular than ever now. They have immense soft power from trade relations, but they cannot go on being the world's factory forever. Everyone in the Western world, apart from Russia and a few post-Soviets, want the US to remain the preeminent power. We take a lot of stress off of them. Most Asian countries want this too. Better for the power to be held by us than by a hostile neighbor. It's true that once you are out of the CIA, you can still be called back in if they need your specific expertise for some reason. But there is a definite distinction between working for the CIA and having worked for the CIA. The world is a jumble of intentions with millions of political, corporate, and private actors all working constantly at cross-purpose. No one is in control. The world is Hobbesian. The United States is the Leviathan. We are the closest thing to establishing an actual order in world history, and we actually did set up an international system in 1945 that is remarkably more stable than the ones that came before it. That does not mean everything and everybody is controlled. You and most conspiracy theorists simply do not understand how power works and how it is actually exercised. The key to our limited successes is that we enforce minimal rather than maximal rule sets. The Illuminati stuff is funniest, like just the thought that there is a secret group of rich, powerful people pulling the strings of society 
in addition to the normal rich and powerful people in society that we all know about. And the degree of control that people suppose is possible is also hilarious. It's insanely difficult to get assets, even compromised assets, to follow through on things you tell them to do already. The idea that everyone at every level of culture and politics could be controlled in that way is pure fantasy. Like, there are social, political, and economic groups like Skull and Bones, Bohemian Grove, Bilderberg with lots of important, powerful members, but they just aren't secret and don't do very much on their own. Like, Bilderberg is basically the same thing as the World Economic Forum, or Davos, except that it isn't public-facing. What are the contingencies for a large-scale collapse, say in the next 50 years, brought on by climate change and economic crisis? There are none to my knowledge. Painfully little has been done by the US on this front. CIA wouldn't really deal with that though. Are there any plans to expand the two-party system? Maybe people won't believe this, but we don't get involved in domestic affairs. FBI does a lot more domestic stuff than us, but also, the FBI does not and could not control the course of American politics. If I had to guess though, I would not be surprised if the DSA left and the ethno-nationalist right got together at some point, as the opposition to the establishment liberals. Who would you say is the most powerful and influential American politician today? Please don't say Biden. Give us something with a little bit more optimism. The most powerful individual is Trump. He wields some dying, uncritical support from probably 30% of the population. But they, largely old, dumb, and low propensity voters, so his power will only weaken with time. As for who is the most powerful ascendant power, establishment wing is probably Buttigieg. On the left is probably AOC. On the right it's basically no one. Trump Jr., DeSantis, Cruz, even Hawley, none of them have the juice. Hawley is probably the most ambitious, but he's a trust fund kid and is never going to get the loyalty of a working class Trumpist base. There is going to be an immense power vacuum on the American right when Trump dies. What do you think is the future for radicalism in the US? Bleak. Basically, it's impossible to forecast. I have no idea how Trumpists will respond to him not being restored to power by voodoo magic or whatever the latest Facebook influencers are saying. Will our social situation improve with the death of the boomer elite class? Probably. Do you think power brokers and authorities in Gen X? There are no Gen X power brokers. Too apathetic. Why has the CIA organized the overthrow of numerous democratically elected leaders and replaced them with tyrants? I'm not old enough to speak for everything that happened in the agency's past. Basically though, the prevailing thought at the time was domino theory, which probably shaped thought until 89 when the USSR collapsed. The democratically elected governments were generally socialist or communist leaning and the fears from policymakers were that they would end up in the Soviet sphere of influence. The thought was that a strong man in our sphere was better than a democratic government in their sphere. My opinion, in retrospect, is that we, meaning the US, did not really understand the internal political dynamics of these countries and made rash decisions that materially harmed these countries and our ability to form positive relationships with them in the future based on a fear that was not really founded in reality. Was the CIA serving the interests of the American people? The agents almost certainly conceived of these as serving American interests. I'm sure that you must be aware that a predominant feature in American conservative thought is a trust of capital and market forces, which happens to align with the interests of these large companies. The CIA, universities, companies, and basically all establishment forces in the United States were overwhelmingly aligned with the conservative movement until probably the mid-80s, with the real split coming in the 90s, Gingrich neocons and being solidified by the misuses of intelligence in the invasion of Iraq by the Bush admin and specifically Cheney. I recommend Robert Draper's recent book To Start a War if you are interested in leaning more on the types of things that forced a realignment of the CIA's institutional thoughts. Why has the CIA repeatedly been implicated in the traffic of drugs and arms? The CIA has its own institutional approaches to problems, 
but works at the direction of the president. The Reagan admin conceived of and directed Iran-Contra, and they told us to obscure the source, intermediaries, and destination of funds from Congress, which had specifically ended the funding for ops in Nicaragua. Again, the purpose was to overthrow the communist slash socialist leaning because conservatives were still convinced that containment of socialist thought was necessary, and everyone, at every level of the establishment, was basically conservative at this point. Why has the CIA financed human experiments using unwitting subjects? I mean, this is essentially how all medical care research works. You cannot tell people what they are signing up for because it influences the results, no? The justification for these extreme measures, again, is Cold War paranoia. We thought the Soviets were working on exactly the same programs, and to be clear, they were, and so we decided that it was better that the technology be in our hands than the Soviets.